Hey Optimancers, Chris here. There are thousands of house rules for D&D floating around. Free feats at level 1, barbarian rages not faltering so easily, endless reworks for character inspiration, ways to work initiative differently, how fog cloud works with advantage and disadvantage, adding key points to the monk, hit point generation, ability score generation, who can provide help actions and when, modified resting rules, summoning rules, attunement rules, how experience points are acquired, countless counterspell modifications, traveling rule modifications, and I could go on. In theory, a house rule is applied to correct a perceived problem with the existing rules. Though occasionally they're added just because the DM figures a rule could use a tweak, or sometimes, a, and I've seen this, because they don't understand how a rule works and want to make something they can understand, or sometimes just because a house rule sounds like it might be fun or interesting. And sometimes they are fun. But house rules really have two main problems that I've personally seen occur countless times. The first problem is that a lot of these house rules haven't been tested or even thoroughly considered, and they end up creating situations where they might be abused, break down, or create new problems, which frankly sometimes are bigger than the issues they were trying to solve in the first place. The second problem is bigger though. Once a DM starts playing around with house rules, they tend to just keep going and they pile up. And the next thing you know, you have way more house rules than anyone can keep track of. This has happened to me as a player and as a DM on multiple occasions. A house rule gets forgotten. Then the barbarian goes to grapple and it's, what were the house rules for grapple again? Then somebody, you know, has to go through the pages of the house rules for that. And then once they do that, it's like, wait, uh, did rage hold with a grapple check in your rules? And then somebody scans the pages of the house rules for that. And inevitably, there is then messages after gameplay. Hmm, actually I noticed that on your house rules for size, I should have had disadvantage on that roll because the creature I grappled was bigger. Whoops. And suddenly your house rules, even if they were well thought out, unintentionally made the game worse because there's just too many to keep track of. The thing is, there are so many rules in D&D already. I mean the player's handbook and the dungeon master's guide alone. And let's remember how many source books there are on top of that but alone they represent hundreds of pages of rules to remember. And yeah, lots of those rules could use a tweak, but is it really worth it? Is it worth it if you create a list of house rules that become clunky to implement? So, you know, we're gonna end up switching a whole bunch of them and everyone needs to remember what they are, but they won't remember what they are. There comes a point where you wonder whether your paragraphs detailing who can do help actions and when are actually making the game better or just more complicated. A house rule being dropped or ignored or forgotten entirely becomes just as common as house rules that actually get remembered and make any noticeable difference in the fun of the game. Oh, and there's another issue. Uh, so add one more problem. So many house rules, in fact, I would say most house rules don't have a noticeable impact on how much fun everyone has at the table, even when they're remembered and don't cause additional problems. So it ends up being that some of the most successful house rules are successful only because they were remembered, but not because they actually made the game better at all. I've played with so many house rules at so many tables, and 99% of them either cause more problems than they try to solve, or they're just not worth it. I've thought about this a lot, and I also thought about what I consider the biggest problems with D&D in terms of design, the biggest imbalances, the biggest lost opportunities, to the point where about a year and a half ago, I started working on some house rules I figured would be easy to implement, easy to remember, and would noticeably fix some issues I had with the game as it is now. Then I started a campaign where we used the house rules, playing weekly, and frankly, I was cautiously optimistic that these rules would be a net positive. Though honestly, my experience with house rules did leave me a bit apprehensive. And I have to say, most of them are fine. One thing I have definitely decided 
is that less is more. If you're creating house rules and you notice you're getting into multiple pages, I think you should reconsider. If you're going to have house rules at all, then I recommend they're few in number, but dramatic in the problems they solve. To the point where I think that next time I'm going to drop all the rest and I'm going to stick with just three. And these three are going to be my permanent and even more importantly, only house rules going forward. I'd like to share them with you today, explain how they work and what issues they solve. Do you like these videos? Do you like supporting YouTube creators? Well, you could support me. Do so through my Patreon link in the video description. If you do become a patron of this channel, you would have seen this video weeks ago, and you would have seen it without any annoying YouTube ads. And if you were a top level patron, well, then you would have been playing D&D with me every month, like these people, Sig, Steven Edmondson, Steven Saul, Steven Bouvel, TUM, Taco Knight, Tazel, Thomas Barrero, Tristan Bello, and Xandar the Mighty. Thank you all so much for your support. Let's get started. Okay, so three house rules. And in my opinion, these dramatically improve the game. I'm going to list them in the order in which I think they positively impact the game, finishing with the one that turned out better than I was even hoping and solved more issues than I even intended to solve. If you want to use them, and I'm recommending you try them, you'll be able to fit all three of these house rules on a fraction of a single page. You'll never need to look these up. You won't forget them. These will be easy to remember, and they will all dramatically improve some of the biggest issues in D&D. We're obviously not solving everything, but these cover a lot for three simple rules. So the first one, do you enjoy optimized builds? Well, take a look at some optimized builds online, and there's two things you'll tend to see. Firstly, they'll all have at least a spellcasting dip, and secondly, that spellcasting dip gave them the shield spell. Why is this? Because the shield spell destroys bounded accuracy in the game. Why would you ever take the defensive duelist feat to provide a plus two or plus three Dharma class against a single attack when the shield spell gives you plus five for a whole round? And it's not even a high level spell. It is a first level spell. You can get it with a one level dip. Without it, Marshals tend to have dramatically lower armor classes than casters, which is the opposite of what it probably should be, unless they dip a casting class to get it. Player characters get a resource that often can just turn off damage from attacks and completely trumps all the other options for reaction defenses against attacks. It's not uncommon for me at all to run games where every single player has the shield spell. And this is for good reason because they feel they need it. Of course they need it, because with a shield spell in the game, that's what you have to bounce for. And if you bounce for that, then the characters kind of have to have it. I've seen and participated in multiple discussions on how to fix the shield spell, because there seems to be at least a majority of players and DMs of the opinion the shield spell is probably bad for the game as it is now. Maybe it should provide a lower bonus. Maybe it should be a higher level. Maybe it should only block a single attack. But you know what? There is a simpler solution. And I'm here to tell you I have play tested this and it's fine. No shield spell. Done. Shield is gone. You can't take it. The monsters won't have it. It doesn't exist. Honestly and truly, I found the game is just better without this spell entirely. Here's the thing that I've noticed. Players and DMs know that the shield spell is a problem, but they're so determined to fix it, they don't consider just removing it. I mean, what's easier to remember? The shield spell being second level and providing you proficiency bonus to defense, etc, 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 or just no shield spell. I'm telling you, D&D without the shield spell is a better game, and how easy is that? It's just gone. Now, what if the shield spell exists on some kind of special list? like the additional artificer spells for Battlesmith or Artillerist. Well, 
In most games, this isn't going to come up, but when it does, I would just let them choose something else. Honestly, there's no spell that they'll choose that is going to cause more issues than Shield would have. Now again, I will remind you I've been playing weekly with this house rule for over a year. This change has only made the game better and is super easy to remember. Okay, so the second one is a bit more complex and it solves a similar issue to the shield spell, but maybe even a bigger problem because this one fixes a mechanical problem and a thematic one. Picture in your head for a moment an iconic D&D adventuring party. Maybe you pictured a fighter, a paladin, a rogue, and a wizard. Are any of them in armor? Which ones? Are any of them using shields? Which ones? Is the wizard the most heavily armored of the whole group? Fully clad in half plate and shield? If not, why not? Because most wizard optimized builds absolutely wear half plate and a shield. Sorcerers too, and bards, and warlocks. Why is that? Well, because they can. I mean, it just takes a feat or a single level dip and they gain a dramatic increase in armor class that doesn't really have a downside. Even without the shield spell, it's not uncommon for the wizard to have the higher armor class than any of the marshals as a base armor class. Does that even make sense? Spells are fantastic. Shouldn't at least those classes that can do the most with spells be a bit squishy? Well, there's a house rule that brings back how you envision these classes. Again, I've been playtesting this for over a year, and I love it. A leveled spell gained through a class may only be cast with armor or shield equipped if that class provided the proficiency for that armor or shield. So first off, I'm going to answer some questions you may be thinking of right now. Yes. If a subclass provides the armor and or shield proficiency, that counts as the class providing that proficiency. So if you are playing a Valid Bard, you can cast leveled spells you get through Bard, including your Magical Secret spells, in Medium Armor and Shield because your class provided you those spells and those armor proficiencies. No, racially provided armor proficiencies do not count as your class providing you that armor proficiency, Though, I mean, if you wanted to change that, I think you could, and I don't think it would cause a problem, because the shield proficiency is really key here, and racial armor proficiencies never give you the shield proficiency. But making exceptions here just makes the house rule more complicated, and I would ask you, what benefit? So you can have more mountain dwarf wizards? I mean, is that so important? Next, no. A feat that provides armor proficiency does not count as your class providing you that armor proficiency. And yes, that does make moderately armored a less powerful feat. And so what? We're not losing anything that makes the game better. Yes, if you cast a spell through a source other than a class, you can cast it without these restrictions. This includes feats, racial spells, or magic items. The Githyanki fighter being able to cast jump in armor and shield isn't going to be a problem. Yes, a caster who gains proficiency in armor and or shields from a method other than through that class can still wear that armor and shield, and they can still cast cantrips. They cannot, however, cast leveled spells from that class in that armor and shield. So if you want a dip wizard to get booming blade for your rogue, you don't need to take off the studded leather. Yes. I tested this house rule alongside the house rule for eliminating the shield spell. No, that didn't explode the game. It made it better. And no, there's not a trail of dead wizards during this time. Turns out, if a wizard plays like they're vulnerable, they can often avoid damage using other methods. And oh, uh, Mage Armor has just entered the chat. And that's the way it should be. Have you looked at wizard and sorcerer spells? Shouldn't they have some kind of disadvantage? Isn't this the disadvantage that makes the most sense? This really shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone who has a good grasp of what spells can do. Wizards and sorcerers don't suck even with these changes. The spell lists for these classes are that good. Though admittedly, the gap between these classes and the rest did get a lot smaller. And to that I say, good. And finally, 
No, I don't find that Cleric is just suddenly the best spellcasting class. Clerics pay for that armor proficiency in how the game is designed. There is a reason why Wall of Force, Bigby's Hand, Telekinesis, Web, Hypnotic Pattern, Find Familiar, Force Gauge, Maze, and other amazing spells aren't on the Cleric list. Because Clerics just aren't quite as good at spellcasting. They get armor proficiency, and it seems like the game was designed to have them pay a price for that, and they should get a benefit in return. And suddenly, the druid with studded leather and shield actually has a better armor class than some other casters. It's like if we go from armor class from top to lowest in terms of spellcasters, we have clerics, then druids, and some bards, then warlocks, then the rest of bards, then the rest. It's almost like a complete reversal of the power of the class spell lists, like how it should have been designed in the first place. You know what this house rule does though? Expect to see more straight class casters. The necessity of that level dip into something else just isn't a necessity anymore, especially when combined with the elimination of the shield spell. Okay, so that was a big one, but I'm telling you, it does make the game better. Now we're on to the final house rule, house rule number three. And this one is a big one too. And this one, even more than either of the others, or the multitude of other house rules I've played with, really does dramatically improve the game. It's also easy to remember and easy to use. I'll tell you the house rule, then I'll go through how I've found it's improved the game. I've seen and played with other versions of house rules that do similar things, but I really think this one works best. When you use the attack action to make an attack using a weapon or unarmed strike, you can choose to take a minus five penalty to that attack roll. If the attack hits, you add plus 10 to the damage roll. So let's start answering questions you're likely thinking of. Then I'll explain why this makes the game so much better. Yes, this is limited to the attack action. And yes, that's deliberate. And if you use this, I highly suggest you don't mess with that. This means that you can't use it with bonus action attacks or any other attack that isn't specifically defined as the attack action. And yes, it really is better than just making it universal, at least in my opinion, and I will explain why. Yes, you could absolutely just dump Sharpshooter and Great Weapon Master from your game. If you do keep them, the minus five plus 10 can't be stacked. I haven't seen anyone take either feet during the lengths of my playtest. Then again, I don't see anyone take the durable feet either. So that's no reason to ban durable. So I haven't banned them and I see no reason why you need to ban them either. Frankly, there's still a benefit to crossbow expert plus sharpshooter because you could gain the minus five plus 10 on your bonus action attack, but that's not nearly as dramatic as without this house rule. So if you want to dump them, fine. I haven't hasn't been a problem. No, this does not apply to spell attacks. This applies to weapon and unarmed attacks only. No, this normally doesn't apply to Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade because casting a cantrip isn't taking the attack action. And at least by intention, no. If a Blade Singer casts Booming Blade as part of the attack action, that isn't considered making an attack with your attack action. It's considered casting a spell with your attack action, and then the spell provides you a weapon attack. Okay, so why on earth would we do this? Well, here's the reasons why. First, it saves your weapon users a feat. Feats are expensive. It's nice to be able to make a weapon using build and have one less feat to worry about. Second, it puts shields back in the game. We first took the shields out of the hands of the wizards, and now we've put them back, but in the hands of fighters and paladins. So you can have a sword and board fighter, and it's actually pretty decent. Imagine your frontliners actually being the ones who wear shields. Isn't that cool? Third, and this was an unexpected benefit, but a huge benefit that I'm very glad for. A weapon user actually has their bonus action opened up. So if a weapon user wants to take crossbow expert or polar master and make a weapon attack, fine. But because they can't do the minus five plus 10, the damage is going to be more modest. So suddenly, there's a reason why you might want to explore some of the other cool and interesting bonus actions available in the game. 
we start to see bonus actions we never saw from weapon users before. You're going to use a telekinetic shove. You're actually going to have your pet attack. You actually took samurai and you're using your bonus action for advantage. Right on. Oh, and monks. Yep, this is a huge boost to the monk. The monk is absolutely devastated by the existence of Great Weapon Master and it not qualifying for a single monk weapon. Now, they can hit hard with their attack action, even if they're doing unarmed strikes. Oh, and, and small races. Suddenly, a melee character that's a small race isn't completely screwed. Small races gain disadvantage to use heavy weapons by the rules, which were the only weapons you could use with Great Weapon Master. Now, they can melee and hit hard with the weapons they can actually use. So what does this do? Well, expect to see a whole bunch of stuff you've never seen before, or if you did see it, never worked before. New character concepts, new builds, better game. Now that's three house rules. One thing I'll say that isn't a house rule that I would recommend to also make your game better is there are a lot of books for Dungeon Dragons. You do not need to use them all. It is not a house rule to say, hey players, these are the books you can use when making and playing your character. That's not a house rule, and it helps you keep control over options. But here are the three house rules I'm recommending. No shield spell. A leveled spell gained through a class may only be cast with armor or shield equipped if that class provides the proficiency for that armor or shield. When you use the attack action to make an attack using a weapon or unarmed strike, you can choose to take a minus 5 penalty to that attack roll. If the attack hits, you add plus 10 to the damage roll. So, pretty easy to remember. Now, do these three house rules fix every little problem with the rules? Of course not. But they do address what I consider the biggest issues. Now, here's some things you should at least be aware of before you implement these. First, Yes, weapon and shield does become the choice option for melee-based marshals. If you are in love with two-handed weapons, expect to see a lot less of them. Second, yes, you're going to start seeing a lot more bows and less crossbows. If you love crossbows, well, they're still fine, but they won't be a default anymore. Third, you're going to see different characters. Players are going to be thinking about these house rules and perhaps making different character builds than they otherwise would have, so you're going to start seeing classes and subclasses and combinations you haven't seen before. But basically, here's what you're going to see. Marshals are going to have better armor classes than other characters. They deliver more damage in combat, right from level 1. The gap between casters and non-casters is going to narrow. Sorcerers and wizards are still going to have the best spells, but they're going to pay a cost for those spells. If those changes to the game sound good to you, then these are the house rules you want to implement. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon.